What is Shiva? In the Jewish circles, there is a, an event which is referred to as Shiva. Shiva means when people are mourning the loss of a loved one. The Shiva represents seven days of intense mourning. This is where the grieving begins from when we lost a loved one. If you have ever seen an invitation to come to do a Shiva call, you would know what that means. A Shiva call means to come and visit a mourner who just lost a loved one, who is going to be spending seven days in mourning and to come and visit them. The word Shiva actually means seven, because those are seven days of mourning. You see, the Bible, the Torah, has taught us as a guide to life, how every part of life, of every aspect of, of life, is spoken of. The whole concept of the Bible, the whole concept of the Torah, is that it is a lesson. It is a guidance. It's a guidance to us. How do we sojourn through the journey of life from birth to death? Our lives are not simple. They're complicated. Our lives is very difficult for us to navigate through. As we emerge into this world, we are basically a soul that descended from high up in heaven, that's a part of God, that went through this long, arduous journey to earth, and it makes it down to this final world. In this world, the spiritual spirit of the soul gets injected into a physical body. This is the only place that it happens is in this world that something spiritual gets infused, imbued in a physical body. Physical bodies are very limiting. A soul in itself is spiritual, has no limits, has no beginning, has no end. But once it's assigned to a physical human body, it becomes very limited. It becomes limited by the limitations of the physical body. It could only be in one place at once. It could only walk so far. It could only hear so much. It could only say so much. It could only see so much. Everything is, seems to be so limited in comparison to the way it was in heaven. The body is a vehicle for the soul. The body has been given to the soul as a gift so that it can remain in this world and have its presence in this world. And our body is in truly on loan to us by God. So how do we make it through life? What is expected of us? What is our journey all about? How do we get from point A to point B? What does God expect from us? What can we deliver to God? The answer is all in the Torah, in the Bible. In the five books of Moses, it addresses everything a human being possibly needs to know how to sojourn through life, to make it from the beginning to the end. And it addresses every single life cycle that we go through. There is instructions of what to do when a child is born. When a boy is born, what do you do at eight days old? What do you do when a girl is born? What do you do when the boy turns 13, the girl turns 12? What do you do for a wedding? What do you, how do you build a family? How are you supposed to eat? How are you supposed to work? How long are you allowed to work? We go through the whole journey of life. In essence, that is what the Bible is about. It's a operator's manual, in essence. It's a guide to help us through 
life. So just like the Torah teaches us about birth, it also teaches us about death. That what happens when the body and soul are going to separate from each other? What happens at that moment when the soul goes through a transition from this world to the next world? Sometimes that happens instantly. Sometimes it's a long journey for that transition to occur. We pray every day that God give us the length of days. The length of days is not just to live a long time, but that our days should be blessed days. Our days should be long days. Our days should be days that we could enjoy and appreciate life as much as possible. We want to squeeze every breath out of life that could be made available to us. But at some point, we are all going to reach the end of the journey when our body and soul are going to go through the transition so that the soul leaves the body and ascends back up to heaven where it came from and the body ceases to exist it begins to decay from the moment the soul leaves the body at that time the body must be only returned to its creator and just like adam came from the ground God formed him from earth, the same thing as we are a microcosm of Adam. Each one of us has a part of Adam in us. We too must be returned to earth. That's why in Jewish law, we cannot do anything with the body, but return it to the ground where it came from. We're returning it to the Creator, understanding that the body really never belonged to us. It was a loan to us from God. It's God's body. And God has instructed us how to return the body to Him, and that is only through burial in the ground. In other words, we cannot do any cremation. We cannot be put in a shelf in a mausoleum. We cannot be preserved in any way, and we need to be returned to earth where we came from. So this journey of life, when a person lives out there a lot of time, no matter how old they are, but when that moment happens, when the soul separates from the body, it becomes painful. It becomes a loss that can never be recovered. Because once the soul leaves the body and the person no longer embodies a soul, the body no longer functions at any rate whatsoever. And that is a sad moment for all of us. The immediate family that suffers a loss references children who lose parents, spouses who lose each other, God forbid parents who lose children, or, or siblings that lose each other. That group of people, as soon as there is a loss, whether it's unexpectedly at a it's, God forbid, a young age, or even at, if it's at a very long-living life. The moment the soul leaves the body, we are instructed to grieve and mourn. One of the ways of mourning is to render the garment. That you render your left side of your garment, you tear it, and you expose your heart when your parents die. It is the greatest honor and respect to grieve them. Even parents that you may have not had a good relationship with, even if parents have been, you haven't seen them for who knows how long, for whatever reason, we are obligated to mourn them, especially parents that you are close with, that you are intimately together all the time. When they pass on, we are obligated to mourn them. The mourning begins when we leave the cemetery. From the moment the grave is covered with earth, the mourners walk in between two groups of people. And these people begin bringing comfort and consolation from that moment as they leave the cemetery. And we tell them, may God 
bring you comfort and consolation amongst the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. From the cemetery, they go home. Most of the time, it's at the home of the deceased or it's at the home where the mourners are at. They are obligated to remain in seclusion for seven days, which means that the world comes to a stop. We don't just go on in life, leaving a cemetery, leaving a loved one behind, but we give them the honor and respect due to them. And that is the seven days. The seven days we don't wear leather shoes. We sit in mourning. We sit on low chairs in our home. And because we don't leave our home for seven days, we bring the services from the synagogue to your home so you can pray as well, so that you can recite the memorial prayer. So those seven days are seven days of mourning. And it's very interesting that the words of comfort and consolation that we say, we don't use the word, may God bring you comfort and consolation. But we say the words, may this space, hamakom, may this place bring you comfort and consolation. And the reason is because God is mourning with you. God is here on this space right now. That your loss is also God's loss. And we spend the seven days in introspection. We spend the seven days talking to family members. And visitors come and stop by for a Shiva visit. That is what a Shiva call is about. It's about taking some time from yourself and making it available to your neighbor, your friend, your relative who is in a state of mourning. There's truly no greater kindness that we can do for one another is by being there with people in their time of grieving. And it's very important to appreciate and to understand the concept of being in seclusion for seven days. Therapeutically, it's epic. Emotionally, it's healing. Respectfully, it's showing the true honor and respect to our loved one. That we didn't just bury them in a cemetery and went on with our life and went to the bar and got drunk from the cemetery. Think about it. When you leave the cemetery, you go home. You spend seven days in seclusion observing Shiva. We can't afford seven days of our life to give to our loved one who has just passed away. They earned it, they deserve it, and we can afford it. And that is the commandment of observing Shiva. May God bless us all that we should not have any losses. We should not have to ever sit Shiva. But when you hear of someone that's in a state of mourning and grieving, make it an effort to go visit them and do a Shiva call. Because when you get there to bring them comfort and consolation, God is going to be there as well. May we all be meritorious to see the resurrection of the dead, that all the generations of the past who have passed on will be reunited with their bodies, and we're going to see each other yet once again. And that will happen with the coming of the Messiah through our actions in this generation, in this time, acts of goodness and kindness will hasten the revelation and the coming of Messiah speedily in our days. Amen. God bless you. God loves you.